Hello, everyone. This is Reyes Ramirez of Fresh Arts. Um, I hope you're well. I hope you're safe. As promised from last Thursday, we have a really, really great treat today. Um, today's session is digital transitions, live streaming tips for creatives, and we have the privilege, the, the gift of having Medley Inc. here today with us, um, represented by Ashley Small. Uh, she's going to walk us through really great tips and really great ways to how do we get our work online and what things to consider, what are best practices for taking our creative work online. Um, and we've worked with Medley, love their work, and so it's a, it's a real privilege. And so thank you, Ashley, for being here. Um, so the, how today's going to work is I'm going to do in this intro going to hand it off to you. And then after your presentation, I'm going to ask some questions that, you know, perhaps would be more centered towards creatives uh, in case if you didn't cover it. So um, anyways, please take it away. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to share today. Um, so I'm going to go through just some essential tips for running an effective um, live stream event. So we'll start there. And then I want to show you all some of the different platforms to use. Um, and then uh, I'll talk about marketing a little bit. And then as Ray has mentioned, we'll open it up to Q&A. So thank you for having me. Um, the most important thing you want to do before you go live is to do a test run. <laughs> and so um, spend some time with your peers that you're going live with or your colleagues to do a test run, either um, live or not live. But if you do need to test the live audio and the live video, I recommend doing a test run, a live test run, maybe before 8 a.m., or after 11 p.m. We find that online users start to peak around 8 a.m. Um, you see peak hours around noon and you see peak hours between 8 and 10 p.m. So if you need to do a test run, do it at nighttime or in the morning. But I do recommend testing the technology, maybe even up to two or three times before you go live. The second tip I'd like to share is to test your audio. And so right now I'm using AirPods and earbuds and they, they work pretty decent, but you can also invest in a microphone or other audio tools if necessary. Um, today I am also using Google Chrome. Um, Google Chrome allows you, it's a, it's a faster browser. It has higher security. You're less prone to experience crashing because many of our computers were not built to um, handle the capacity of live streaming and video programming we're doing today. Um, so Google Chrome is best suited for that. A couple of other things I want to share before we I'll show you some examples is to, if you're unsure of where to look, look directly into yourself and the live stream, which is what I'm doing now. Or you can look at your camera, which is right above your screen um, when you're doing an interview. Sometimes you'll see split screen interviews and it looks like both users are looking in different directions. So best practice is to look right into your um, camera if all else fails. And the last point I want to make around kind of visually preparing, um, coming from a journalism background, I used to work at the Houston Chronicle, I've worked um, with many TV stations here in town, is you kind of want to consider um, solid colors, solid prints. At Medley, we like to encourage bright, strong colors, um, just like you would see in television. So those are some tips to prepare. Um, you know, check your audio, um, check your um, check the technology, check your lighting. I didn't talk about that, but I do recommend having strong lighting, whether that's natural light or investing in lighting equipment. So those are the tips to prepare. Check your technology, check your audio, invest in lighting, wear solid colors if possible, um, and always do run throughs when possible. So from here, I would like to show you all. I don't see any questions yet. I'm just making sure there aren't any comments or questions here. Please let me know, Angela, if there are any. But now I will spend some time talking about the tools. So I'm going to show you a few slides. So today we are using StreamYard. And StreamYard allows you to customize a little bit. Um, as you can see with Reyes and myself, we had our custom name um, boilers at the bottom. We have the Fresh Arts logo, and it also allows you to broadcast in the back end. What we all know is the most popular streaming tool right now is Zoom, with millions of users um, using it every single day. Um, we decided to use StreamYard for this live stream, but I want to talk about Zoom a little bit. So Zoom, this is me, Maheva. Shout out to Maheva if you're watching. Um, 
Zoom, uh, some of the benefits of using Zoom are that you can have up to 100 users with the pro account, which costs about $14.99 a month. You can also record your meetings, whether it's a live meeting or not. You can record it, download it. What I love about that is that it allows you to add some customization if you need to afterwards, and you don't if you don't necessarily want to do a live stream. Um, it allows you to access features such as polls. You can chat. If you upgrade to webinar, there's a Q&A feature. I love the accessibility features. You can do closed caption on um, Zoom as well, and you can do breakout rooms, which are ideal for large groups. So those are the main benefits of Zoom, just Zoom's kind of basic package. And then I'll move into Zoom webinar. This is a screenshot from one of our webinars at Medley that we had about two weeks ago, and we use Zoom webinar. Zoom webinar is pretty much, it sounds, it, is, it works as it sounds. It's um, for webinars and presentations specifically. And so as you can see, we were showing slides here and the Mahaven I were presenting. So if you have a visual piece that you want to show and talk about, but you also want to be able to have your voice and your face on the screen, I do recommend Zoom webinar. It also allows you to have a lot more controls around people, um, users talking and chiming in. Um, they, they can raise their hand. You can implement the Q&A feature. So there's a lot more control around conversation using the Zoom webinar feature. And then the last slide I want to show you all was Be Live. Um, Be Live is similar to StreamYard, which is what we're using now. It allows you to um, customize. As you can see here, we just kind of put a fun background here. We were able to add our title here. I did Fresh Arts test. And over here in the right hand corner, this is their logo, the Be Live logo, but you can customize and add your own logo as well. Be Live is about $24.99 a month for their basic program that allows you to add your logo and customize. The things that I don't um, particularly like about Be Live is that you have to use your Facebook or Gmail account to sign up. And um, so, you know, there's not, um, I, I have some security concerns around it, but otherwise I think it's a great platform. So I just want to show you those tools there. We have Zoom, Zoom webinar, Be Live, and then we have StreamYard, which is what we're using right now. Um, okay, so. Did you all get my screen on that? Okay. So I'm, I'm waiting to see if anyone's gonna comment and let me know that they, they were able to see my screen or not. Okay. So I will go, um, I will keep going. And then so some final tips, Reyes, let me see, I see some questions here. Okay, you saw my screen, thank you. When I came back, I couldn't tell, thank you. So I will move on. Some final tips around marketing for uh, live stream events and going live is um, because we're online more than ever before, in fact, the social media users, there's been about a 44% increase in social media usage in the past month. And so because we're online in ways we've never been before, there's less of a sense of urgency around a long term marketing timeline. And so previously we'd look at 60 days, 90 days out. And because our news cycle is changing every single day, we're looking at two week marketing campaigns, one week marketing campaigns when it comes to promoting your digital events. And so I just wanted to uh, to kind of give some insight around the new way of marketing. As the news changes every single day, we have to adapt. And we know that users are getting new content every day. And so we recommend marketing a live stream event two weeks out, an aggressive push one week out, and then a more aggressive push days leading up to the event. One of our other marketing recommendations is to invest in digital advertising because there's so many people online right now, it's hard to break through the noise. And so digital advertising allows you to reach your target audience directly. And it also allows you to um, save money because digital ads right now are down. The cost of them are down by about 16 to 20%. So I also want to recommend um, investing in digital advertising. And the last point I want to make is to invest in email marketing because we know that users are online more than ever before. About uh, Most brands are increasing their volume in email marketing by about 19%. And seeing open rates at about 25%. So invest in email marketing. And of course, um, you know, take advantage of our live tools like what we have right now um, to reach your audiences. 
those are my main tips. And Reyes, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. I do see we have some live comments here. Okay, <laughs> the people are just saying, yes, they saw my screen. Okay, thank you all for commenting. Um, Reyes, I'm happy to take any of your questions or any questions from audiences. Yeah, uh, we don't have any questions from the audience yet, but please, if you do have a question, if you're watching this on Facebook, uh, please post a question. I can see it and I can screen it and I can ask Ashley directly. Um, or if she sees it, I'm sure she'll take it up. But um, I, I suppose one question that I have is you went over some of the live streaming uh, apps, softwares. Um, I'm wondering, why do you believe in your experience um, Zoom is the industry standard as opposed to, let's say, a StreamYard or anything like that? Is there something that's just more accessible? Is it just more available? Do, do you kind of like know, uh, yeah, like why it would be the, the industry standard as opposed to anything else? Yeah, so we have, been, we were early adopters of Zoom. Um, our agency, we um, started working remotely about three years ago. We've done it on and off for many years. And I would say that it's an industry norm before this crisis happened. And so um, before this crisis happened, many organizations were just using Zoom. One, because they have a free version that allows you to go live or just to have a meeting for up to 40 minutes. I think that's the key. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, if you upgrade, you can download your recording. And so for us as a team, it's really important that we're able to download our recording along with the chat feature. And so I think it's a tool that many organizations were already using just for regular meetings or managing their remote work workplace. And now that this um, we're in a different state, you're seeing the masses use it. So I think it was kind of the industry standard before. Um, and it's just kind of maxim, um, been mag you know, magnitude since then. And so with that, uh, there is kind of a difference um, between, let's say, a Zoom and a Facebook Live, right? And so like there's the, the software, the app that uh, contains, I guess, like that, that would record or format or however, like it, it, the interview or the content, but the actual presentation of it to an audience. Uh, could you kind of go a little bit over that in case some of the viewers don't know, like, Oh, is, if you just click Zoom and then it's everyone can see it, or uh, I so you're go ahead. Sorry, so I suppose my question. Sorry for being long-winded about the question, but the question is then, um, could you kind of go in the difference between, let's say, like a Zoom and a Facebook Live? What purpose do they serve in in the present? Oh, I see. Okay, so. Facebook, I didn't talk about Facebook or show you screenshots of it, but Facebook right now, their live feature only allows you to go live with one user at a time. Um, so that's the advantage of using third party tools like StreamYard, which you're using now because it allows you to have multiple users on at, um, at one time, as well as Zoom does. And then you use these tools to stream to Facebook or in StreamYard's case, you can stream to Facebook or YouTube. And so that's the value of it is that you're able to stream and have multiple conversations. And so when you think about Facebook, I would think about it like this is um, I want to broadcast a single message to an audience opposed to using StreamYard, Zoom, Be Live, where I want to have a discussion and host it on a tool like um, like Facebook. Um, Facebook is rolling out their Zoom competitor. It should roll out any day now and it will allow up to 50 users on at once. Um, they are they are claiming to have really high level security features, but just like Zoom and StreamYard, it will allow users to access the um, the content even if they don't have an account as long as they have the link. So I look forward to that. Um, Zoom, how I see Zoom standing out from the other live streaming platforms, is it really has been the industry standard, not just for live events, but for kind of internal virtual meetings and conversations. That's the real difference. Thank you. Um, so we do have some viewer questions. Uh, I'm sure you see them, but uh, I'll go ahead and read them out loud for our viewers. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Mark Fury. Uh, he asks, would you consider talking a little bit about the process of using ads? Oh, yes, absolutely. So we do host, lo work, um, host monthly workshops at Medley. We hosted one last month called Boosting Your Business with Digital Ads. 
ads. And it's available on our website right now, medley-inc.com forward slash workshops. And so that can be downloaded. So we have done talks on that. And of course, Reyes, if you want me to come back and talk just about digital ads, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I do believe that taking a deep dive into digital ads takes more than you know, 30 minutes, maybe even an hour because it is a complex space. Um, we are Google AdWords certified company. And so when we do, when we host our workshop, we do take a deep dive. So to answer your question, absolutely. If Reyes would like to have me back to talk about ads at some point, I'm happy to do that. But in the meantime, um, we do have some, some content on our website that you could download. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we have a question also from Pavlina. She asks, or they ask, which social media is better to go live for visual artists, Instagram or Facebook? Great question. Um, so let's look at demographics. Facebook, you have audiences from the ages of 13 to 65. And when you look at the breakdown from the people in their teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, pretty much an even split. Um, it's also an even split around income, educational level. And so I say all this to say is Facebook is reaching the masses. And so I'm going to always recommend Facebook first, just because we know that everyone is on Facebook. My nieces are on Facebook, my, Facebook, my aunties are on Facebook. So it's, it's like a non-negotiable in my opinion. Um, and now let's look at Instagram demographics. Their user base is primarily between the ages of 13 and 29. And so it really just depends on where your core audience is as a visual audience, as a visual artist rather. Um, the thing about Instagram that I um, kind of want to make sure you're mindful of is that their audience tends to stay within the app. There's not a lot of conversion on Instagram. And so in other words, users are there to scroll. They're not really there to take action. Um, so so I guess my answer would be Facebook. <laughs> um, Instagram, it, Facebook, if you're really trying to sell and if you're really wanting to sell, and I know they're rolling out more features for live streaming that will allow you to sell within your um, live streaming. Um, whereas Instagram does not have those features. I think Instagram is efficient for um, just awareness. So in one more example I want to give you is that I have a friend, Karina Polk for Lettuce Live. Shout out Karina. And what she does is she'll go live on Facebook for 30 minutes and then move over to Instagram. Um, and if you're using a tool like Zoom or StreamYard, you can record and export that file and then upload that to Instagram as a post. And so that's another option is to export the video and add it to Instagram. But so I would recommend Facebook just because that's where everyone is at and people are converting into real cu um, customers and sales on Facebook more than Instagram. Thank you for answering that. Um, I suppose a follow up question and feel free to jump into a next topic if you have another talk uh, or if you have another slide to show up. But um, one question I would have is so in following up with that with Instagram versus Facebook. Um, so I know at least here us with us at Fresh Arts, we use different softwares, different apps for different purposes. So for the roundups, we've used uh, Zoom uh, and Facebook Live, and you know we're kind of testing those out. Um, for this, we've used vMix on our Thursday workshop, rather in discussions, we use vMix, we've used, uh, yeah, we're now using um, StreamYard. And so like, would you recommend people using their social media like across the board, like, oh, if I post it on Facebook, it needs to go on Twitter and Instagram. Or would you recommend kind of using each each software or each app um, for its own purpose as a, as a creative? So like if you're a painter, like, oh, I'll do my live paintings on Facebook, but I'll do posts of the finished product on Instagram or what have you. Yeah, I think each tool does have its different um, benefits. And so because Instagram is so visually heavy, um, you know, strong photos and videos do really well on there, especially in particular stories on Instagram. I do see Instagram as kind of being a behind the scenes tool, whereas Facebook may be the final product. Um, and I don't want to negate LinkedIn for, you know, arts, artists are business owners. And there is a, a business community on LinkedIn that is actually um, you see a high conversion rate on LinkedIn as it relates to 
business deals or business opportunities. And so LinkedIn, I believe, is another platform to kind of show finished product or to tell your story as an artist um, because LinkedIn has their publishing tool as well. And so I, I do believe that each platform deserves a different type of content for sure, for sure. Every platform deserves similar content, but the way in which it's produced, I think, should be a little different. You are starting to see more integration of services or features, though. For example, on LinkedIn, you are seeing more emojis. They're introducing a live video feature. Um, and Facebook, as we talked about earlier, is introducing live video, too. So we may end up looking up six months from now, and we can have the same type of interactions on each app. But right now, um, I do believe they serve different purposes, for sure. And so and then in terms of maybe it's getting a little too technical for uh, okay. for some purposes, but like in regards to the actual presentation of the work, you mentioned uh, different demographics, right? So Facebook may have a will have a different demographic than Instagram than Twitter. Um, what which app or software that you've seen kind of provides the most intuitive or like the most accessible breakdowns of the demographics like why should let's say me as a poet right like look into like the back end of like a facebook live video and you know and see what what numbers there are um i would say linkedin but i don't want to spend a lot of time on linkedin because i don't if i um if i were an artist myself i would not spend a lot of time on linkedin but you can definitely get more insight in terms of who's looking at your profile, of course, who's looking at your video, who's looking at your content, um, where they work, of course, how long they spent on your content. So LinkedIn analytics are very robust, but Facebook is as well. And so, uh, you know, one thing I want to make, make sure of is that, you know, we're, we're live right now. We know that we know that we're reaching audiences. They're obviously watching. But um, what I love about Facebook Insight is that we're able to watch the impact of our live video as it goes on. And so you won't see, you see the highest numbers of viewers after the live stream airs. And so we'll be able to look at the data tomorrow and Saturday and Sunday and see how the data is um, improving as our li this live stream in particular lives online. And so what I love about Facebook is that you're able to you know, capture the data in real time and then capture the data as the content lives online, particularly with live videos. And so um, I would say Facebook more than Instagram gives you that vehicle because Instagram, whenever you go live, once your live stream ends, the content is done and um, they don't have a feature to record the content. And so as it relates to data, I would say Facebook for sure, um, as well as LinkedIn is up there. But um, I do appreciate the fact on Facebook, your content can stay online, you can continue to get more visibility and track the data. You can't do that on Instagram. All right, um, so we do have some more viewer questions. Um, so we have one question from uh, Mark uh, again. Uh, what are your thoughts on TikTok? That's a great question. I think TikTok is often um, overlooked. It's an amazing vehicle for advertisers. Um, the, the two platforms that I think are often kind of overlooked and forgotten about are TikTok and Pinterest. Um, and you do see high conversion on both as it relates to advertisers. I know for sure Pinterest, something around 73% of users are actually shopping on Pinterest. And so for those of you who are visual artists, I highly, highly, highly recommend using Pinterest um, because you see more active shoppers and about 86% of its users are women. And so if you're catering work toward women, you definitely should be on Pinterest. Now, TikTok, I think it's a great tool, um, especially for advertisers. But again, kind of going back to Instagram, they have that younger audience base between the ages. They're, they're people audiences are between the ages of 13 and about 35. And so if that's your core audience, and I do recommend spending some time there um, and investing in an ad campaign in particular. If you're not advertising on there, it is more challenging to get organic visibility amongst new audiences. And so um, if you are looking to reach younger audiences in a visual way, TikTok is absolutely a viable tool. Particularly if you have content that's intriguing and short, you know, video clips, as you know, the platform focuses on. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Anastasia. Uh, do you think people need incentives to create an extra push for engagement with the content? Like if we wanted to ask people to send in videos of their own or create something for a specific challenge? 
That's a good question. Um, Crowdsource video does better than professionally produced video, actually. Um, and so today's consumer wants to receive content that feels rich and authentic and organic. And so I think when you have an opportunity to create an incentive like that, absolutely. Um, I know that I've been seeing celebrities do these all-day all fundraisers where they're just having um, users sign on and watch different performances all throughout the day. But while they're doing that, they're also raising money. And so you're able to have access to rich, interesting content while also raising money. And so I think incentive driven ideas is a great way. It's a great way to go. I'm looking at the question just to make I make sure I ask, I'm answering it. Um, so, yes, one thing to know about Facebook's kind of guidelines around advertising, if you are thinking about creating video or photos, is that you want to make sure your content focuses on people and images opposed to text. Because if you do run a campaign like that um, with video content and it's too much text on it opposed to people and images, your content is less likely to be seen. And so the kind of rule of thumb is the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 visual content and about 20% text. So when you talk about engagement and content being seen, I just wanted to share that as well, that you might, you want to focus on kind of rich media opposed to just text heavy content, which is challenging to do in this digital era because we're not out taking photos. And so this is a good time to look in, you know, platforms like Shutterstock and Emoto Canva, which was allow you to pull content on your own. Thank you for answering that. Um, I suppose uh, a follow-up question I would have with that um, in terms of visual, textual. Well, let me preface that with another question. So you mentioned earlier about emails uh, and investing in email uh, campaigns. Uh, one way that I heard put that I really, really get put into perspective for me is, um, you know, how many people have a Facebook versus an Instagram versus a Twitter account, but then how many people have an email? And, you know, most surely you probably, you're gonna need an email to do any of that. And so in essence, people, every, nearly every person that you can contact digitally has an email. Um, and so do you, could, do you mind recommending or providing so, like maybe a small overview of the different uh, email apps or softwares um, that you recommend or that you've seen are intuitive or uh, quicker to pick up on? Mm, so Constant Contact has been the industry standard for, I don't know, the past 20 or so years. Um, but I believe that the new industry standard is MailChimp, um, just because you can do really uh, aggressive, advanced testing. You talked about data earlier with MailChimp. You can do A-B testing. You can do split testing, which split testing is really important right now because many of us are just starting to try to understand what type of content resonates with our audiences. And so MailChimp will allow you to send out the same email with, you know, two different headlines, for example, and then see which headline is performing better. And so we've got to be really data-driven, data-oriented, and MailChimp is really, a, I think it's a lot more advanced in that space. And then I'm switching gears a little bit, but social media ads, you can also do A-B testing. I want to make that point for everyone who's listening. Um, if you're thinking about launching a social media ad campaign, you can also do A-B testing as well um, to see which ad is performing better. But um, going back, yes, MailChimp uh, I, is kind of the industry standard. Those are the two that we really rely on at, at, at Medley for sure with our clients. Most of them are on MailChimp. It integrates the social media a little better than Constant Contact. But if nothing else, the data is incredible. The insights you get on user behavior as it relates to how they interact with your newsletters and as well as how they respond to your subject lines and your content within your newsletter. So I recommend MailChimp for sure. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. A follow-up I have to that then is you mentioned data and then we, we have to be conscious and absolutely, but uh, I suppose as an artist or let's say as a creative, um, can you kind of like maybe break it down a little bit in terms of like why those things matter, like why demographics matter, why accounting for, uh, you know, clicks in terms of like someone maybe who's never done an email campaign before and they're like, oh, I, I guess this section likes it a lot. What do I do with that information? Yeah, I mean, the data is important because 
right now we know consumers are online more than ever. And so if we're going to be investing time in pushing content on social media, we should be thinking about which content is the most effective. And so that's why I love this idea of digital media marketing because I come from a print background. I used to work at the Houston Chronicles, I mentioned. And we know that when someone is reading a newspaper or an ad, for example, looking at an ad, we don't know how they felt when they saw the ad, what they did when they saw the ad. I mean, how it resonated with them. Whereas online marketing, this is insight in terms, did they click on our website? How long did they stay on our website? Um, did they share a link? And so it just gives us more, more insight on how to build out our digital strategy. So for example, if you are just now launching a social media campaign and you're asking yourself the question, I don't know what's working or what's resonating with my target audiences. I recommend one, starting with following them and listening. So it's, you know, social media allows us to go in and listen, see what they're sharing about, see what they're, uh, you know, liking, see what content they're engaging with. That's the first thing. And the second thing is to test out content, maybe take, do a test run for, you know, an entire week, seven days, and you post three different types of content. One is a video, one is a photo, and one is maybe a blog post. And then see which ones of the which which type of content perform most um, perform best on your social media, and then you adapt your content strategy based on that. So in other words, um, analytics gives us insight into how we shape our marketing strategy. As digital marketers, our job is to get people to your website. Once they get there, we start working with your web developer to understand what's the, what they did when they got there. So for example, we may find that they stayed on your about us page for you know, 15 minutes and then they went to your e-commerce store and then they were there for one minute and dropped off. We want to look at the data and figure out where the disconnect is. And so there's tons of reasons on why the data is important, but now with users being online is more important now more than ever for sure. And so it really does help you guide your website development, your website design, it helps you guide your content marketing strategy as a whole. And in some way it informs your business model because you might find, okay, we don't have a lot of interest in these programs on our website. No one's clicking on them. So maybe you should reconsider these programs as a whole. So it just helps you shape your strategy in a, in a nutshell. The data is important. Um, it also helps you reshape, get a better understanding on who your target audiences are and um, what audiences your content resonates with the most. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like it's got a really great education right now on that. Um, okay. We have a, another question. Mark is on it today. Uh, how much? <laughs> Hi, Mark. Should, how much should someone expect to spend on an effective ad campaign? Um, that's a great question. It really just does depend. Um, at our agency, we see on average, um, you know, three hundred. To add 200 to 500 dollars a month on average and these are campaigns that are more geared toward awareness some conversions some call to action but mostly just kind of maintenance campaigns um, but just like any any space um, the more you spend the more visibility you're going to see the more success you're going to have so for clients who are having big events maybe you're doing a large virtual event and you really need to reach the masses um, you may want to invest more like one a thousand dollars a month or two what I love about Twitter, and we didn't, we haven't talked about Twitter that much. Um, Twitter, what we found during this current crisis is that users are going there mostly for information. And so we don't talk about it a lot because it's not necessarily been a vehicle for selling, but it hasn't been a great vehicle for information. And you are finding um, that they've had a spike in users in the past month on Twitter. But how Twitter, um, the reason why I brought up Twitter is because you can pay to play on Twitter. And so you have to spend a minimum of $50 per, per tweet to run an advertisement behind a tweet. But you only are billed whenever someone favorites the tweet when they retweet it or when they click on a link and so twitter you it costs it's kind of expensive minimum fifty dollars but you do get to optimize it in and more than you do on the other platforms so to answer your question i would say you know starting off a couple of hundred dollars per month just to build some awareness and build buzz and eventually increase your budget based on what you're seeing. What I also love about social media advertising, Mark, is that you get plenty of chances to kind of right the wrongs. And so if you find that maybe you've allocated 
a budget of $20 a day on online ads and you, you're running it for a week and you find by day one, you've already spent what $10 or something or, you know, half of your budget, half the day. Um, you can go in and modify your ads. So you have time to go back and look at the data and see if it's working or not. And so maybe your ads just not performing well. You can go in and add new text, add a new call to action. And so you have opportunities to right the wrong on digital advertising. Thank you for answering that. Um, a follow-up to that that I have then is in terms of like investing, uh, you know, having a digital online presence, that that is an investment. It costs money. I know I have a website and uh, that costs money. Um, do you recommend any particular organization or institution or any group that would look at, let's say, one social media? I know I've heard of some artists that uh, will, you, you pay someone to look over their Instagram and give them some pointers or some, temp, some tips. Uh, is there anything that you particularly recommend or is that something that you shouldn't do or is that what, yeah, what have you? Um, um, there was a little feedback on the question, but I think what I heard you asking was, um, should you pay someone to kind of do a social media audit for you? Um, or should you do it on your own? Was that the question? Right. OK. OK. So, yes. And so, um, you know, just, just like our agency and many other marketing agencies around town, we typically start with a social media audit where we're looking at what you're doing, what's working, what's not working. That includes a competitor analysis. So we're looking at your competitors, what they're doing, what's working, what's, what's not working. And then we look at the trends around your target audiences, how they're engaging on social media. Even as an agency owner, I bring in a third party at least once a year to kind of look at how we're describing ourselves on our websites and on digital media, because we sit in a space where we um, we're kind of, Mm, not siloed, but we we may not be able to step outside of ourselves and see our organization holistically. And so I do recommend bringing in an expert for sure, um, just to make sure that who you say you are and what your mission and value statement is, is aligning, is resonating with your digital presence. So yeah, and then just to make sure you're, you're, you're um, maximizing on the space, I do recommend it. And I know that in the in this space, um, marketing can be a large investment. And so I'm not saying that it has to be an ongoing retainer around digital marketing, but maybe once a year or twice a year, bring in an expert to look at your social media accounts, make some recommendations, maybe create a content strategy plan for you to implement throughout the year. And then maybe once you touch back with them, you do an assessment to see where you've gone since then. So to answer your question, yes, I do recommend hiring an expert to take a look at what you're doing and where the possibilities are and what your competitors are doing. Just really quick, do you, by any chance, do you recommend any kind of, uh, I, I obviously depends on each person's budget, but like, is there like kind of like a, like a standard or a median of how much that costs or? Yeah, so I mean, I would say it, it does depend on everyone's budget and it depends on how many social media profiles you have. Um, so you have to take that into consideration and then build out your hourly fee based on that. Um, but I've seen these audits be anywhere from $500 to $5,000. So it really just depends. But I would say um, an average rate may be somewhere around two thousand dollars what i'm seeing kind of average but it does just range and i think it depends on how complex your organization is and how much time the expert would have to spend assessing it for sure thank you we have another viewer question for you uh from emma do you have a general roadmap for data analytics for instance start a spreadsheet update it every week then what yeah, that's definitely one way to do it. Hi, Emma. Thank you for the question. Um, that's definitely one way to, you know, attack your analytics um, is to input them manually through Facebook Insights, Instagram Insights, through your Google Analytics. Um, so that's one way to do it. Um, we at our agency, we love Sprout Social. Um, it can be a little costly. So I want to say the minimum investment is about $100 a month. But what we love about Sprout Social is that you can it pulls reports for you. And so you can look at comparison reports. So what we've been looking at a lot of our agency is these past 30 to 60 days versus the previous 30 to 60 days and looking at how our client social media metrics have changed. Um, so it allows you to do comparison reports pretty easily. Um, it saves you a lot of time. 
So the investment has uh, has the potential to pay off because if you're an artist and you're applying for grants or you're wanting to be in a new gallery, a virtual gallery, or you're just looking for new opportunities, being able to pull data on your um, analytics pretty quickly is important. So in some ways, the investment could pay off because you have beautiful reports that demonstrate your impact and influence. Um, Sprout Social also is an aggregator and a scheduler. So you can aggregate all your social media platforms into one space. You can schedule them out with the platform and pull beautiful, comprehensive reporting around engagement, you know, engagement, likes, clicks, shares, or impressions, views. And so, um, so yes, I do recommend uh, Sprout Social, which is a tool that already allows you to do that. But if you can't invest in Sprout Social, then the way you recommend it actually is a good idea with the spreadsheet and actually going into your analytics for each platform each week, going into Facebook, Instagram, and um, LinkedIn, whichever other platforms you're using. Now, Google Analytics does have some pretty interesting reporting that you can just export directly from there. But yes, I do recommend tracking it week to week, especially during this time, because we know that web activity is changing week to week. Thank you. Um, can you go a little bit further in uh, some tactics on how to promote a virtual event, especially because everyone's doing a virtual event uh, right now? So do you recommend like Facebook posts, create a Facebook event, event calendars, what have you? You know, it's a tricky time because as a marketer, you know, I know that we need to get the word out through my own um, endeavors as well as our clients. But I think it's also important to be sensitive right now um, because we are um, also we're in the middle of a crisis. <laughs> and so um, I would just say, you know, we, we would in the past, you know, promote an event five five times at least within you know two weeks, which is a lot. And so we are scaling it back a little bit in how often we promote an event, um, just because we know we don't want our users to be inundated with content, promotional content. But the content you all are providing is so useful. I would just say if it's relevant and timely and speaks to our audiences right now, definitely promote as often as possible. A live event, um, I think you all do a brilliant job hosting the event on Facebook running some ads before the event goes live, um, posting about it in your stories, which I saw you all did on Instagram this morning, um, promoting it in your newsletter. And then I also think, think it's a good time to maximize on that post event um, marketing. And so we talked about it later. You do not get most of your viewers in real time. You get most of your viewers in the playback. People can watch it on their own time. And so I recommend after we're done right now, and I think you guys are already doing this, is to go back and boost your live streams. Um, you can't boost it in real time, um, but you can do that afterwards. So I, I'm really leaning into maximizing the information after words. Um, one thing that we're doing at Medley as well is everything we do on digital after it's done, we upload it to our website and, and um, allow users to purchase it. Um, again, just repurposing that content over and over and over. Um, we're, we're shifting toward content marketing and less toward pre-content development marketing. <laughs> and so I think that's the way to go right now. I think it's, it's a, it's a sound tactic right now we're being overwhelmed with so much information and we're being told get on this live get on this webinar join us live um don't forget you have an opportunity to reach those audiences forever really thank you um do you have any tips for artists to maximize their view engagement or to enhance their viewers experience mm, that's a good question so the first part was maximize say that again maximize engagement with audiences? Yeah, I mean, I think you all are doing a good job here in terms of having live questions come in. Um, I showed you Zoom a little bit. We didn't get to interact with Zoom that much, but you know, it has the polling feature, it has a Q&A feature. Um, Instagram does allow you to have others join your Instagram live feed with you. So that's always an interesting way to engage with people in real time. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Those are the main things inviting live conversation, whether that's through chat like you're doing here now or on Instagram, you can actually in, in, um, invite people to join, um, join your live stream with you. Thank you. Can you also then speak on to how artists can extend the life of their video projects, um, like either through embedding on their website or creating a YouTube channel or a Vimeo channel or uh, yeah, rather than it just being a post and then it's 
in the past? Or? Absolutely. And that is one of the reasons I mentioned earlier why I do love StreamYard and Zoom because you can, and even Facebook too, you can export the file and use it for evergreen purposes. And so the key is to make sure you hit that record button whenever you go live so you'll have that file and then you can pretty much do whatever you want to do with it. We love using a tool called, um, here's some tools that you can use that are kind of for those of you who are not video production experts or video editing experts. Um, Animoto is a good one. It allows you to take content like this, drop it into a template, add your own text. Magisto is similar. Um, it allows you to add photos and videos into a template, edit on the go. I know Mark was, Mark was listening in earlier. He is a fantastic video editor. So by all means, if you have the budget to hire a video director and editor, so if you, by all means, if you have the ability to hire an expert, do that. But I also want to talk about some tools. Um, we Video is a very interesting tool that will take, if you have a 30 minute video and you want it to pull out the highlights from that 30 minute videos to make a five minute succinct video, it'll do that for you. And the last one I want to I mention is Vimeo, Vimeo Movie Maker. Um, and so Vimeo is actually a good tool. And YouTube has some interesting editing tools on the back end as well. So those are the tools that I recommend. So my point is you can take this content, export it, upload it to any of those platforms and repurpose it for years to come. Even taking snippets of it to use when appropriate. We're encouraging a lot of our clients, even though we are in the middle of a um, pandemic, we're encouraging clients to create timely content, but also evergreen content that'll be relevant six months from now, a year from now, so they can continue to repurpose it. And so while we are focusing on, um, you know, help aiding artists right now, I think this is the new way of doing business in many ways. And so a lot of these tools will be applicable six months from now, a year from now, 10 years from now. And so, um, so yeah, I, the main tool is export the file, repurpose it, um, modify it. Absolutely make sure your content is on your website. I absolutely believe in up having a YouTube channel. YouTube is the number two search engine. It's owned by Google. And so from for, for the sake of search engine visibility, you definitely want to be on YouTube. Um, so yeah, I could talk all day about repurposing content. I think that it, content has the ability to go on and on as long as you have the time and attention to make some modifications and tailor it to your audience. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I have kind of like a side question that perhaps adds on to this and other things you brought up, but in terms of accessibility, um, do you recommend any particular software or um, anything to consider like, for example, like a transcript or subtitles or um, what that does for, let's say, for engagement? That's a great question. And I'm going to be honest and share that I don't think technology has caught up to the needs around accessibility. Um, so we have a long ways to go there. But um, Zoom does have a closed caption feature. Um, it will automatically translate your text um, in real time, your words in real time. It's tricky, though, because it's not always going to get it right. It also has a feature that will allow someone to manually transcribe. Unfortunately, it does not have transcription in multiple languages. And so there's a huge missed opportunity there. Um, if, you're, but you are, if you are hosting something in um, say for example, um, Spanish language in real time, you can have someone on your team translating in real time for you. Um, but that's as far as I've seen um, in terms of inno innovation around um, accessibility. Now there is an app, I think it costs 99, like a dollar a month, it's called closed caption, <laughs> pretty straightforward. So if you're creating footage on your phone on the go, you can upload it to that app and it'll do the work for you. And it's actually pretty fantastic. So it's called, I'm pretty sure it's called closed caption, pretty straightforward. Um, but I, I do think we have a long way to go around accessibility for sure. Um, and then kind of winding down uh, before we uh, go into the conclusion, but um, part of sort of a selfish question. Uh, I'm, I'm a writer. Um, could you maybe go a little bit on, you've mentioned, a, you've mentioned it earlier about visual versus textual. Um, is there a place for like blogs or like kind of like more text heavy article kind of content for artists or like in a newsletter or on a website? Or should the newsletter do one thing and let the website do the blog or what have you? Yeah, so, you know, in a perfect world, if we all had a lot of time on our, had enough time on our hands, we would be producing 
a weekly blog, the same day of the week during a consistent time, maybe it's every Tuesday morning, your blog goes live at 10 a.m. That blog then, has, there's a snippet of that blog in your newsletter that goes out Tuesday afternoon. And then that same link goes out through your social media. And then to take it even a step further, you link it out, you link it to Pinterest and perhaps publish it on um, LinkedIn publishing tools. And so in a part of the world, that's how it goes. But um, unfortunately, I, I know that I found that in recent years, a lot of our clients aren't, aren't able to commit to blog content because it does take a lot of time. One thing to consider is, you know, creating, I, I use the word evergreen a lot because I think it's important in marketing, creating evergreen content. So maybe you're spending one day of the week, one day of the month rather, in going ahead and fleshing out five blog posts, posts for the entire month. The reason why I think long form content is still valuable is because again, it gives you more um, kind of visibility in the search engines. Um, if you are writing blogs that are geared towards your target audiences, and we know that newsletter email subscriptions are going up and newsletter open rate is increasing. And so that's the reason why I recommend investing in it. Um, but I do, I do think that content has to be repurposed. And so whatever you're saying in your email or your blog, I do recommend figuring out how to sh shape that content in a visual way. So it resonates with your audiences on, um, Instagram and Facebook. So it's not necessarily saying that you have to publish your blog on those platforms, um, or take screenshots of them, but how do you communicate that message through video? video or photos, the same message that you're talking about in your blog. So I do recommend long, long form content. Um, I know it's time consuming, but you can um, spend some time doing um, bulk writing just to get it out the way. All right. And then we actually have a follow up question from a viewer on that. What is the ideal text length for a blog article? That's a great question. And so our standard at our company is 500 words. Um, I think anything less than that can be a little challenging to get your message out, but anything more than that, you definitely lost your audience. <laughs> and so, you know, the, the truth is today's consumer is not reading long form content as much as they used to. Um, so you have to capture them in that first, you know, 200 words or you lose them pretty quickly. So 500 words is kind of our industry standard as it relates to blog content. That's a great question. All right. And so we're winding down. Um, is there anything else that you want to mention or uh, if you want to drop any links or direct anyone towards anything? Um, no, I mean, I think the most important thing to do right now is focus on your understanding your target audiences. I do want to say this, you know, we don't believe that you have to be everywhere at once because TikTok is up and coming. I don't think necessarily means you have to be there. But if you know that you need to reach a younger audience, absolutely look into it. Um, so we don't believe you have to be everywhere at once. Really look at the platforms where your audience is and spend a lot of time cultivating their, your relationships there. So that's the one thing I want to recommend. And so Second thing is look at your data, see what's working, what's not working, see who's engaged and who's not engaged on your social media platforms and your website. And then last thing I want to recommend is coming up with a content strategy. And so my hope is that some of you all who are watching will go back and actually come up with what's your what are your posts on Monday or your post on Wednesday and Friday and come up with the strategy. And it just helps with accountability. Um, and then just don't be afraid of um you know, having some technical hiccups. <laughs> um, we've used StreamYard before and it just crashed on us before, so I'm so glad it didn't this time. But be okay with the fact that um, every live stream, every live event is not going to go perfect, go well, um, go be perfect. I think that in this digital era, we are giving a lot of um, grace to others during this time in particular. So don't be afraid about pushing the content because just like um, you may be feeling those insecurities, someone else is feeling insecure too, but they're still going to and publishing their content and reaching new audiences. So don't be afraid. We are all um, wanting to absorb new content, particularly from the arts community during this time. Thank you so much. Uh, could you mention uh, Medley's website once more? Yes, great question. Great point. So um, our website is medley-inc.com. Um, to access our past and upcoming workshops, you can go to medley-inc.com forward slash workshops. Thank you so much for adding that. And we're on social uh, on all channels at Medley Inc. Thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, thank you so much for speaking uh, with us, for answering a lot of those questions. Um, thank you so much. And uh, I hope you're well and I hope you're safe. And 
thank you. Can't wait to have you on again if we if we ever if we ever need you again. Of course, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. So there you have it. Uh, really great information. Uh, really great talk. Uh, really great. Uh, Ashley is really great at answering questions, as you saw. Uh, so please feel free to visit their website, look at their sessions. Really great, informative stuff. Um, so again, if you're tuning in, if you haven't tuned in before, Fresh Arts, we're a nonprofit arts organization. Uh, we provide research to artists, particularly within Houston, but also our digital content, like the one you just saw, um, is available, available for anyone. So uh, feel free to share, feel free to like, feel free to send it to anyone else. Um, just some things that are coming up on the horizon. Uh, next week, we are going to be on Tuesday where I do a resource roundup, where if you're looking for certain resources, uh, definitely check that out. Last week, I did how to provided articles on digital transitions for artists that led up to this. Um, this next Thursday, next Thursday, we're going to have an intro to grant proposal. Uh, writing, maybe you've seen it in person, maybe you haven't, and if uh, if you haven't, this is a great way to get a start into uh, grant proposal writing if you've never done one or if you just want some tips uh, to improve that process. May 14th, we're going into fundraising for artists. So Ashley um, went more into the technical, uh, what softwares and what apps to use, but May 14th is we're gonna get into monetizing. How do you make money from those posts? How do you um, get some change from the content that you're producing on social media online? So May 14th, fundraising for artists. Um, and then also, if you have any topics you want for us to cover, in particular, if you have any ideas, please submit any topics you want for us to cover on the link below, or you can email Angela at fresharts.org. Um, please feel free to tell us anything that you want covered, or if you have an event and you want us to blast it through our channels, we're more than happy to do that and support the artist community that way. Um, you can email me at reyes at fresharts.org if you have any events, and I can post it wherever we have it. Um, so again, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you tune in Tuesday and next Thursday. Um, and yeah, that's right, we actually have a Fresh Arts Artist Resource Library, which is accessible anytime, whenever you need it, uh, where you can see business resources, toolkits, and webinars. Uh, there's the link, check it out. I wanna thank um, Angela, who is in the back, who is responding to your comments on Facebook. Uh, she coordinated and, and developed a lot of this stuff that you're seeing, so thank you to her. Um, and yeah, and I hope you stay safe. I hope you stay healthy and I'll see you next time. Thank you.